la misma escena que viví en esa persecución. La, estuve soñándolo tres noches seguidas, para serle sincero. In August 2021, two U.S. Border Patrol agents chased an SUV carrying a group of undocumented immigrants along a highway in southern New Mexico. This is not going to be a good scene. Ten people were in the car when agents chased it to a curb in the road. Almost every one of them was ejected as it rolled over. Two of them later died of their injuries. The guy that pretty much scalped right over here, this guy, he's breathing, but I, I couldn't get a pulse on him. I, I think he's gone. The Border Patrol says that the driver lost control of the wheel and crashed. But there's more to this story. Within 20 minutes of the rollover, agents called their critical incident team to the scene. Um, our critical incident team's coming out. They do all the kind of crime scene stuff. We're not crime scene, but critical incident team. All right, and right. Statements and all that. We can share A recently things. leaked document reveals that critical incident teams are designed to prevent litigation against agents involved in fatal encounters. And there's mounting evidence that these secretive units may have been used to hide agent misconduct. At the end of the day, they're they're one thing, they're cover-up teams. These teams have operated for decades, most of that time without the public even knowing they exist. In May, Customs and Border Protection, which oversees the Border Patrol, announced that it will disband critical incident teams by the end of the year. But there was no mention of the past cases that these teams have handled. We don't know if these teams affected the outcome of hundreds of investigations into deaths resulting from encounters with Border Patrol. We, we just don't know. By chance, lawyers obtained a copy of the critical incident team's investigation. One would imagine that that would be a pretty exhaustive report that asks and answers the most basic questions about the incident, and this certainly doesn't do any of that. Realmente lo único que le puedo decir que pasó ahí fue que nos dimos vuelta en esa curva cerrada a esa velocidad. Realmente eso es lo único verdadero que está en ese informe. Lo demás, todo eso es falso realmente. Todo eso es falso. Who was it a bus? Uh, no, it was a single vehicle that was that had multiple people that pursued by Border Patrol. Ah, uh, that explains it. his thumbprint, and it has his name with his birth date and then his passing day. And what's hard about that is his birthday, his passing was, he was 10 days from being 26. Angie's son, Eric, a U.S. citizen, was driving with nine undocumented immigrants on the night of the crash. He would always tell me that he would take care of me. He goes, I'm going to take care of you, Madre. I'll take care of you. you know, don't worry about it. I got you. I got you back. He would tell me that. Eric's spine fractured, his lungs collapsed, and he suffered a traumatic brain injury when he was thrown from the truck. He was brought to a hospital in El Paso and put on life support. So I hadn't heard from him Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. And then I put the missing persons report on Sunday. So the next day, my sister came and she called several hospitals. And they said, no, he's not here. And uh, well, the next day I go to work and she calls me and she says, I found him. You need to come here. He's here. And that's when I saw him. You know, he was there by himself for five days, laying there, other people making decisions for him. Neither Border Patrol nor the hospital called Angie to tell her where Eric was. She says agents were waiting in the lobby and they wouldn't explain to her why her son was lying in a coma. Even now, yes. Uh, nobody's told, really told me anything. Little by little, I found out about the accident, what happened. You know, I was putting the puzzle together. Hey, 
This is New Mexico State Highway 185, and it's about somewhere along here that the Border Patrol claims they first noticed Eric's car. It would have been between 4.30 to 4.45 in the morning, and there are no houses or street lights along here. It, it would have been pitch black at that time. This is the Border Patrol checkpoint, and this is where the Border Patrol claims that Eric tried to go around the checkpoint rather than through it. So technically, this is officially where the chase began. About three miles past the Border Patrol checkpoint, where an agent says they saw Eric's car coming across this bend at a high rate of speed, lose control, and then start to roll over. Came right across here and landed in that pecan orchard right there, where seven of the 10 passengers were thrown from the vehicle, including Eric. Look, you can actually see evidence. Here's windshield. There's still bits of the car. 11 months later. Radio dispatch recordings obtained by the ACLU suggest Border Patrol hit Eric's car. We are needing assistance for Border Patrol. They did clip a vehicle. There are seven to eight patients all in response to So of course our question is, is where did that come from? That had to have come from somewhere. This dispatcher is not making that account up. The ACLU also obtained the Border Patrol Critical Incident Team's report of the crash. The agency has never released one of these reports. It came in response to a records request to the New Mexico State Police. The investigation concludes that there was no contact between the vehicles and offers no further explanation. The report includes photos of Eric's truck, but no clear ones of the agent's cars at the scene. It's amazing how many photos they have of this vehicle, but and not, not a single one of the Border Patrol vehicle on the scene. Yeah, not a single one. In a timeline of events, the agent investigating the crash describes one of the vehicles in pursuit as a marked sedan. But these photos are of SUVs and they were taken six days later in unknown locations. There's no information in the report to prove that those are actually the vehicles that were involved in the pursuit. These pictures are obviously taken at night, outside, in some other parking lot. They're not being taken on the scene. This one, even more concerning to me, is in a garage, uh, clearly on something that appears to be a vehicle lift, as if it was being worked on. No sé por qué dicen que chocamos, en qué chocamos. No chocamos en nada. Realmente fue algo que ellos provocaron por el impacto que nos pusieron en la parte de atrás del carro. Fault lines spent weeks tracking down survivors of the accident. Ese dolor siempre lo siento en esa parte de mi columna. Este siento la molestia en la parte derecha de mi cuerpo, pues me impide cosas que antes me encantaban hacer como correr, jugar fútbol. Lesvin Gamas was in a coma for six weeks after the crash. His spine was fractured and part of his scalp was torn off. That night was supposed to be the last part of his journey from Honduras to reunite with his family. Cerré mis ojos, apreté mi celular y hice una oración y que no nos vaya a seguir, Dios que no no. Pero no, el coyote que nos traía pues perdió la calma y lo que lo primero que él hizo fue pararse si tal vez fueron unos 10, 20 metros adelante, él se paró en una orilla y nos empezó a gritar a todos, recuerdo, y nos decía, tírense. Y recuerdo de que solo se tiró el que iba enfrente con él de copiloto. Cuando yo miro eso y a todo esto, yo volteo a ver así para atrás y yo ya miro la patrulla atrás de nosotros con las sirenas encendidas y todo eso. Pero la Border Patrol en sí lo que hizo fue de que cuando miró que el primer inmigrante se tiró, nos pegó en la parte de atrás, recuerdo. Recuerdo que pegó, pe estrelló la camioneta de la Border Patrol y la estrellaron en la, en la parte de la camioneta en la que nosotros íbamos atrás. Recuerdo yo que nomás nos pegaron en la parte de atrás. El coyote agarró el carro como que si era un Ferrari, un carro que guau, wow, corría, pues. Y yo. Yo quedé viendo el velocímetro del carro y ahí vamos como asiento y algo a una velocidad exagerada, como le digo, el carro hasta temblaba 
y fue cuando yo me estoy parando así y me estoy pasando por enfrente siento donde el, uno vuelve a pegar la border patrol y ahí fue realmente donde yo ya perdí la conciencia pues ya en the academy they teach you the professional way that number one if you six suspect that they are undocumented migrants, that's not worth chasing a car at high speeds around a school zone or anything like that. But when you get into the field, what they teach you is you chase them until they crash. And that's kind of like this thing that we used to say, chase them till they crash. Until the moment you told us that about the hits, no one has heard anything about there being contact between those two vehicles. Es increíble, por eso le digo de que ellos van a tratar de justificar las cosas malas que hacen, ellos van a tapar lo malo que ellos hacen, ellos la culpa siempre va a ser de del más débil, del que no se puede defender, pues es la palabra de ellos contra la palabra de nosotros los que salimos damnificados en ese accidente. Lesvin told us Border Patrol never contacted him to get his account of the crash. The critical incident team report includes summary statements from the other survivors, but each one is barely more than a sentence long. Is there any investigative value in this? Not really. They're not very thorough. James Wong was a senior official in internal affairs at Customs and Border Protection, the agency that oversees Border Patrol. You'd want to ask them about, you know, how fast were you going? Uh, did anything strike your vehicle or did your vehicle strike anything else or there's a whole list of uh, questions that would pop up but it, it appeared that they wanted to know where were you sitting what did you see the driver do customs and border protection did not respond to our questions about this crash at least 22 people died in vehicle chases with border patrol last year 11 times more than 2019 CBP blames this rise on smugglers trying to flee agents. What was your reaction when you learned that Border Patrol had a secret investigative team? So what I see now, what I'm knowing is they're just the cleanup crew. They're like the men in black. They really don't, you don't see them, but they're just there to clean up the mess and to cover up. They're not transparent. They're hiding things. You know, why not communicate with me and tell me what's going on? You know, your son was in an accident, this and that. We were involved. Nobody. My son could have died all by himself. Border Patrol obviously are, is doing something. And they keep doing it, knowing that they're hurting people and causing deaths. Human rights lawyers first exposed Border Patrol's critical incidents teams in 2021 while investigating the killing of Anastasio Hernandez Rojas. This case is the anatomy of impunity. This case describes exactly what steps Border Patrol takes to protect its own. Anastasio lived in the U.S. for more than 25 years without citizenship papers. He was deported in 2010 and soon tried to cross back into the U.S to rejoin his family in San Diego. He was apprehended by Border Patrol agents who brought him into the station and they described him as holding his head high, looking in their eyes. And when they asked him to throw out his water, he poured it out slowly. And their response was to kick out one of his legs. He asked for medical attention and they denied it repeatedly. Agents then brought Anastasio to a border crossing in San Diego to deport him. And it was there that they took his pants off, they hogtied him, they put him face down, they beat him repeatedly, they tased him, and ultimately knelt on his neck. And they did all of this in front of hundreds of bystanders. Border Patrol claimed that Anastasio was unrestrained and combative. He suffered a heart attack, five broken ribs, and a fractured spine. He was declared brain dead at the hospital and died three days later. His death was ruled a homicide. What was it that caused 
hacerle eso a un ser humano, porque era un ser humano, era una persona que lo único que quería es regresar con su familia. Anastasio was 42 years old. He left behind his wife Maria and five children. Al igual porque esto que le pasó a mi esposo no se vale, no es justo. No es justo. Destruyeron una familia. Dejaron a mis hijos y su padre. Lo, ma lo mataron de la peor manera. Cada que me recuerdo de él, pues me da mucho sentimiento de, de que una persona tan linda este, ya no esté a mi lado. And that's the tragic end of the first chapter. But there's another chapter. And the next chapter is about the impunity that ensued, the cover-up that ensued. After the assault, the San Diego Police Department opened a homicide investigation. A detective repeatedly asked for security camera footage of the incident. But the Border Patrol eventually told them that the security camera footage had been recorded over. The video was passed through many hands. The last hands it touched were the Border Patrol Critical Incident Team. They had an affirmative duty to preserve all of the evidence, including the video footage, and they did not. The Border Patrol Critical Incident Team members were present at every critical moment, and they made sure that Anastasio's case could never be prosecuted. It was on a pedestrian bridge like this where a crowd started together at, at night and looked down and they could see what was happening to Anastasio down below. So they took out their phones and they were taking videos and photos and the border patrol agents saw it and they came up on the bridge and they actually took their phones from them and deleted the photos and the videos off of their phones and dispersed them. But one young woman put her phone in her pocket and walked away before the agents came up. It took two years for the video to surface, but it appears to show Anastasio surrounded, pinned to the ground, handcuffed, and begging for his life while an agent tases him. single agent has been held to account in that case. Not only have they been able to continue to work, some have retired with full benefits, others have been promoted. Since Anastasio's death in 2010, at least 145 people have reportedly died in high-speed pursuits and use of force incidents involving Border Patrol. No agent was convicted in any of those cases. People who are identifying the evidence and saying what is evidence and what is not, and the people who are collecting it and collecting it poorly are doing it on purpose, and that's the set team. You can't convict anybody when the evidence was improperly gathered. You can't use any of that against the agents. So you see how they protect themselves? Last year, a Border Patrol training document was leaked to a journalist. It revealed the stated purpose of the critical incident teams. They state that their mission is to mitigate the liability of agents and the agency. With that in our hands, we had a smoking gun. We understood that they themselves were trying to protect agents from being investigated and from prosecution and from civil court. Why do you think it's been so hard to get answers about Anastasio's death? ¿Por qué? Porque ellos son, este, son, son agentes que están cubiertos por, su mismos, por ellos mismos. Y es lo que yo siempre he dicho, mientras a ellos no se les castigue, no se les encarcele, no se les sancione, no se les ponga cargos, esto va a seguir. There's a kind of impunity that they seem to have. 
when they look at the facts of this case, which is more than 10 years later, and no one has ever been held to account for that. Border Patrol is such a large organization now, and they've been funded so extensively, it would be a huge embarrassment to a bunch of people to say, okay, we got fooled. I mean, this is a rogue organization, and somebody should have stopped it years ago. Customs and Border Protection is the largest law enforcement agency in the country, with nearly 20,000 Border Patrol agents. After scrutiny from Congress, the agency announced it would disband critical incident teams by the end of 2022. In an email, CBP told fault lines that they would consider hiring former critical incident team members in the unit that's taking over their role. It's a good political move. It's uh, good publicity. But will it make a difference? No. And that's because I have a strong suspicion they'll reconstitute those teams under a completely different name. Faultline sent a request for an interview with CBP's commissioner, Chris Magnus, but the agency declined. Border Patrol has grown in size, it's grown in power, it's grown in uh, jurisdiction. Um, and that, coupled with the fact that there is very little oversight and virtually no accountability, means that they are the greatest threat to the people in this country. In 2017, Anastasio's family settled with the U.S. government for $1 million. But their fight for accountability isn't over. Maria has brought Anastasio's case to an international human rights commission in Washington, D.C. A hearing is scheduled for this fall, a first for a case involving U.S. law enforcement. It is the tip of the spear that broke the credibility shield of Border Patrol. And the family's prayer is to reopen these investigations, the investigation of Anastasio and all of the other people who have been killed by Border Patrol agents, because we now suspect that all of those investigations were corrupted and covered up. Que cada gente que, que viole los derechos de una persona, que golpea a una persona, que asesine, que les pongan cargos. Ya no más, creo que para mí eso sería lo justo. Ya sufrí yo, mis hijos, pero que otras familias ya no sufran todo esto. Que pare todo esto. Well, I miss him. Um, it's not the same. He is what he is, you know, he has his, he had his, his things, no, no child is perfect. And, but I know him and I know how he is. He's not a bad person. Somebody high up there knows about them and they're giving them the okay to do what they're doing. What would justice look like to you? For them to admit what they did because of their hiding. I mean, how can you respect um, the government who does that and accepts it. A man died. Where is the justice for that man? I mean, let's say he was a smuggler. Did he deserve to die? Es su trabajo, les pagan para eso, pero deben de buscar una manera en cumplirlo donde no pongan en riesgo la vida, donde no se pierda vida humana, porque Si a eso vamos, mejor que, mejor que nos estén haciendo esperados desde la frontera con, con pistolas y nos disparen antes de que crucemos. Para, si a eso vamos, ¿me entiendes? Porque prácticamente están haciendo lo mismo. Están haciendo lo mismo. Ellos se, la, se, se van a lavar las manos, se lo van a justificar y la culpa siempre es, como le digo y le vuelvo a repetir, del más débil. El más débil siempre tiene la culpa.